Oh yes, thank you UA so much for this kind introduction. And also from my side, a very warm welcome to everybody around the world to this webinar about new developmental care and the influence of the microenvironment in our NICUs. The question for me is uh, how we can improve our daily care practices for neonates, parents, and also last but not least for ourselves. So why we should do, how we can do, and what attitude and technology is needed for that. Within the next hour, I will share with you uh, my ideas about an optimal microenvironment in our units for premature infants, but as well also for sick term newborns. But first of all, let me introduce myself and my workspace here in Berlin, Germany. I work now for three decades as a consultant in the level three unit, and uh, we are uh, taking care for approximately 3,000, 3,500 uh, births per year. Among them are approximately 100 very low birth weight infants. That means children with a birth weight below 1.5 kilogram. And among those are uh, 60 extremely low birth weight infants with a birth weight below one kilogram. As we don't have enough rooming in facilities in our unit, we created an extra space for our uh, parents. We called it a parental hotel. This is uh, nearly 200 meters away from my unit. So every uh, mother, every father has a chance to stay there, not directly with the baby, but close by. And uh, we have a combined uh, neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit and pediatric intensive care unit uh, equipped with 14 beds. Uh, we are wall to wall with the maternity unit and we have uh, single, double and also triplet rooms. One regular but in emergency cases up to three rooming in facilities uh, could be provided for the parents. And in our unit, we have a strictly one baby, one bed philosophy with GF Omni beds, and we are fully equipped with them. Beside my clinical work, I run a small teaching uh, and education company called NeoTrainer together with an experienced nurse, Anna Calbert, and we cover different topics in the field of perinatology. Uh, in this context, we do nationwide, uh, as well as in different countries, workshops and presentations about different topics in neonatology. A short overview about our programs you can see in that slide, but today I will focus mainly on development, developmental supportive care concepts and family-centered care aspects with the focus uh, on the microenvironment in the NICU. Last but not least, I have to clear that there are no conflicts of interests. We work in our new trainer structure together with different companies and uh, as consultants, and we provide workshops and presentations. None of uh, them ever influenced any content. None of them asked to advertise products or philosophies. So the today's webinar topics you can see here. First, we would like to go, uh, would like to take a small step into the history of newborn incubator care. And then we will compare that to the national development in utero and make clear that the neonatal intensive care unit is an artificial environment for our children. And then I will switch over to the microenvironment and give you some ideas about practical issues regarding to delivery room management, challenges for minimal handling, the contact with the parents, some ideas about transporting uh, very immature infants, and last but not least, temperature, humidity, and hygiene settings. Let me start with the history of newborn incubator care. 
So we have to take a short look into the past of neonatology. Dr. Cooney was one of our colleagues, a smart guy who traveled throughout the world showing very small preterm infants in world exhibitions. And for that reason, he was in Paris, London, Berlin, and also New York. And always the audience was very impressed. As it often seen at uh, fairs, his boost was sometimes close to the Congolese village. And on the other side were the Jodler from the Tyrol Mountains in Austria and Italy. He was the one who created the term minimal handling as his interest was to see his babies survive, not only the exhibition periods. Therefore, he developed incubators building on the former archetypes of baby incubators from Tanier and Boudin. And those incubator shows were called sometimes freak shows, but on the other hand, they saved really a lot of life of a lot of preterm lives. But the fact, in fact, parents didn't pick up their babies anymore when they were ready to leave the exhibitions. So that shows clearly that no contact between parents and the child mean that there was no possibility to bond. Here you can see an ICU setting in the late 70s of the past century. And you will probably recognize that we all were very fascinated by new technologies, more modern incubators compared to the ones you saw before. We had first neonatal ventilators and improved monitoring for uh, immature infants. But probably you may also recognize that there was a discrepancy between such an environment and the premature infant. The brains of those infants was promised a different environment for sure. In my eyes, that means that there was an urgent need for changing the micro as well as the macro environment for the children. In other words, how we can better adapt NICU care to the needs of an extrauterine fetus. Heidelise Alts, the grand dame of the uh, NITCAP concept, she asked uh, a couple of years ago a more philosophical question and she said, should we make a person fit for the environment or should we better make it the other way? That means, should we adapt our NICU policies more to the needs of these tiny infants? Another idea you can see here from the 50s, the so-called isolate rocker. Um, maybe you think sometimes uh, some of us developed right idea about ideas about care setting for uh, tiny preterms. The idea behind that isolate rocker was to improve brain development after preterm birth, especially improve the sensory system for balance and self-regulation. There was uh, really small evidence for such an approach. You can read it here in the publication. They smiled more while being rocked. It was interpreted as a signal of increased well-being. And um, nowadays, we made uh, most of us made a complete U-turn. We try to perform brain protection with a maximum of parental sensorial saturation for a fetus outside the womb. This brings me to give a short introduction about the natural development in utero. Brain matters was one of the key messages of Nikki Goldstein from the University of Kentucky. And she wrote a, a paper about developmental care for premature infants. And you can see here one of her statements. 
Various organs, especially the brain, are exposed to toxic effects of medications and therapies that can surely interfere with normal development and function. And it is no wonder that many of those tiny, tiniest premature infants exposed to repeated aversive sensory inputs during the early months of brain development are plugged with sensory integration difficulties in later life. We must accept that the long-term new developmental outcome for premature infants doesn't improve significant over the last decades. We have learned that from the Epicure studies with, which compared extremely low birth weight infants between 95 and 2006 and also by other researchers. Professor Dieter Wolke from Warwick UK appeals to us that we should more invest in social neuroprotection and watch out for healthy brain development in the early, early stage of life. Preterm infants are born during the most crucial phase of brain development. It means to occur in utero in preparation for birth at term. But uh, instead, with preterm birth, this complex developmental process occurs in a hospital setting, which is far different from the expected environment in utero. Why is it so important to focus on the preterm brain? We should remember that a preterm, regardless of his gestational age, is still a fetus. A fetus who develop in an artificial, some might say wrong or even a toxic extrauterine setting. Some, like Heidelise Alts, might say alien environment. And in that time, the neonatal brain is growing more rapidly than in any other time in life later on. So let me summarize. Preterm infants are still fetuses who develop in an extrauterine setting in a time when their brains are growing so rapidly. You can see that in that slides, the weight is doubling within a couple of weeks and reach the weight of 350 grams at term. Synaptogenesis continues throughout the whole gestation and also beyond. At its peak, 15,000 synapses are produced on every cortical neuron, resulting in 1.8 million new synapses per second between two months of gestation and two years after birth. The last trimester of pregnancy is the most critical time frame for brain development. It lays the foundations for emotional well-being, social competence, learning and memory capacity cities. But this will take place in such an environment. You see here an NICU in the 60s from the States. I doubt it. So what I see in the last decade is that there is a paradigm shift in perinatology. The long-term consequences of preterm birth are the major topic and challenge instead of only preterm mortality. Regarding to this, more and more neurologists are thinking about an appropriate life quality, whatever this unclear term could mean. This is more and more the focus of our considerations. And this term must be determined individually in each particular case for each individual preterm and each family. So we try to prevent long-term morbidity and strengthening the parental and child competence. Hugo Lagerkranz from uh, the Karolinska Hospital in uh, Stockholm in Sweden said that the neurobehavioral sequels of prematurity is one of the major pediatric public health care questions of our time. And I think he is right with that conclusion.
Let's now step into the NICU as a uh, truly artificial environment for our infants. Nikki Goldstein again, she said environment matters. A preterm infant is born between 23 and 42 weeks gestation and he has to spend two or up to four months growing and developing outside of their mother's wombs. They leave the quiet, dark, painless intrauterine environment much too early and enter a world filled with bright lights, noise, painful stimuli and separation from their parents. The immature organs are required to function long before they are ready. And if we step into the NICU, we can compare it with the uterus settings. You can hear a heartbeat from the mother with the noise surrounding for preterm infants for, for an infant for 10 months. In utero, it is warm, quiet, the baby can hear a mom and her environment. There is a soft fluid ambient. It is mostly dark and there are gentle movements and undisturbed sleeping cycles. And I see you cold or warm, pain and stress, high ambient sound levels as you can hear in the background, high light levels. A lot of routine handling, inappropriate positioning, and mostly isolation from the parents. There is something wrong in that extraordinary world. There is a lot of negative touching. There occurs resuscitation and intubation, transition to another incubator, IVIM subcutaneous injections, replacement of feeding tubes, diaper changing, insert, insertion of central lines, and many, many other more. And if we calculate that, we will recognize that there are 200 of those uh, manipulations or events per day, and up to 15 procedures per day are very painful. In comparison, non-negative touching, carrying and holding a baby, skin-to-skin -skin contact is provided mostly by the parents and it occurs only in 8% of all daily contacts. Have we really gotten better in the last years? This is the most modern NICU in Beijing, in China, and this is a 400, approximately 400 uh, Nico bed facility with approximately 20,000 live births per year. A very well respected hospital in Beijing is where an individual approach is individualized approach possible in such a setting. Probably not. You can see modern technologies, modern ventilators, modern incubators, but that is only half of the story. So let me switch over to the micro environment and start with the delivery room management, but only short. What we try to do in our unit is to avoid early separation between the baby and its mom, to create a secure attachment behavior and also prime the neonatal microbioma. You see in this video a 24-weeker with a gestational age of 570 grams and this baby get a chance to bond with the mother, with his parents right after delivery from the 35th minutes of life for approximately one hour. And for me, this bonding period is very, very important. We try to perform a gentle transition after birth. Only a few preterm infants need to be resuscitated. This early bonding is 
Anxiolytic for the parents, it induces a secure attachment behavior later on. There is a layer of initiation of lactation. We not only need pumps to get the milk from the mother's breast, we need hormones, we need oxytocin and prolactin. And this early bonding provides also the neonatal microbioma. For such procedures, you need very modern equipment, which provides thermostability, modern equipment regarding to safety issues, and stable respiratory support. Another slide, uh, 23 weeker on CPAP after less invasive surfactant administration and uh, uh, transition period in our delivery room and that baby had a chance to bond, not on mother's chest, she de declined that, but uh, side by side with her uh, right after birth. And you can do that also with term babies. This is a newborn, a term newborn with a diaphragmatic hernia. This baby uh, I had to intubate for sure. It was high frequency, frequency ventilated. And after stabilization, we give the baby the chance to bond on mother's chest for approximately one hour as well. Challenges for minimal handling. If you have a modern equipment, uh, you can see that here uh, the advantages of a modern hybrid incubator, um, you can do your jobs much better. Many of us use the term minimal handling, but there is until today not a clear definition what that really means. We would prefer the term to use the term controlled handling. It has to be implemented as a basic philosophy in the care strategies of the whole team and it also requires appropriate equipment. In this picture you see the insertion of a central IV line in a 23 weeker and this procedure requires optimal thermostability and avoiding cold stress for the infant even in the open incubator mode through a built-in radiant heater. This heater in combination with servo mode skin temperature control guarantees within less than five minutes a fast temperature ramp up when opening the canopy. In addition, it gives the staff the chance to work under optimal ergonomic conditions due to the adjustable height of the incubator. Here you see a duct ligation in our NICU uh, in a giraffe omnibed care station. And this is what I mentioned earlier with the one baby, one bed philosophy. If a preterm or a sick newborn needs uh, surgery, we don't have to change uh, the beds. There is no need for bed transfer. And we have continuous thermal stability and uh, perfect monitoring through the whole procedure of wet duct closer. Parental contact, what does it mean regarding to the microenvironment? What does it mean to be a mother? For most of the women, it means I will breastfeed my baby, I will hold my baby, I will provide secure attachment and give my child mutual attention and empathy. And this is fascination and we call it love. This is all evidence-based and this is human sense and there is no need for any studies regarding to that. But how should this work through the bull eyes of an closed incubator? It is quite difficult, I think. To be separated from the own child 
in front of the closed incubator, one mother wrote on Facebook, until you have a premature baby, you will never really understand the great distance between one pane of glass. And that's true. A closed incubator is always a symbol how vulnerable and technique dependent a child is. And we have to keep in mind that a high number of parents experience post-traumatic crises after premature birth. Those crises affects every parent, regardless of the level of education, of social, economic or familial, familial embedding. And those traumatic symptoms in mothers occur and persists in 50% after discharge from hospital, in 38% after one year, and still in 13% after two years. This has surely consequences for the treatment success and I believe that our medical treatment process is at risk if we don't discharge healthy, stable mothers and fathers as well as their children. A couple of years ago, in, under the Facebook top 10 was a book, How to Survive the NICU, from Jennifer Daggett. And that is what we should always remember. Not only the baby is struggling to survive the early phase of life, also the parents have to survive the NICU time frame. This is Professor Dame from the uh, University Hospital Charité in Berlin uh, at the time the Berlin Wall was falling in 1919. And he um, had tried to remove um, this uh, tablet from the entry of the unit. Caution to all mothers of ward number 30. Your children will be shown to you twice daily between 10.35 and 11 a.m. and from 4 p.m. and 4 p.m. 45 in the afternoon. Exceptions only after personal consultations. Fortunately, those times have changed. Parents are parents and no longer visitors in most of our units. They have free access to the NICU and they are part of the caring team. What we like to establish is that, is that parents are primary caregivers. They come more and more into an active part of the treatment process and the nurse is staying more and more backstage. She is more a consultant, a supervisor and her task is to teach the parents how to take care for a tiny infant. And this is a paradigm shift in the nurse's role as well. In Europe, we had the so-called each Carter. This is the European Association for Children in Hospital, and uh, it was founded in 1988. In, in Article 3, you can read, in order to share in the care of their child, parents should be kept informed about ward routine and their active participation is encouraged. This is nearly 30 years old. So we should open our units to the parents and encourage them to take the pool position in taking care of their child. Enable very close contact between mother and child whenever it's possible. And don't forget that a closed incubator is always a symbol how technique dependent and vulnerable 
a baby is. Adjust the level of the incubator easily to make it as comfortable as possible for the mother. Rotate the mattress or the nest so mother and child can come into direct eye contact. So my message is try to open an incubator, try to bring parents and kids together as soon as the medical uh, status is allowing that. This is regarding to psychology, opening the classic incubator. The rotating mattress allows eye-to-eye -eye contact. Thermostability is always provided, even in the open mode. Lowering the incubator for parental access. And on the other hand, you lift it up for procedures and handling by the staff team. Open the unit for the siblings. This is very important. A modern NICU is taking care not only for the baby. A modern NICU is taking care for the whole family. And if you want to create a stable family situation, even after very premature birth, it is important to take care of all of the family members as much as you can. On the other side, even if you have modern technique, don't forget that parents are the best incubator. And my colleague Robert White from Indiana in the States mentioned more than 15 years ago Future NICU design should recognize that the baby must spend most of the time in its mother's arms. I would change that a little bit and said also at its father's arms to get the maximum benefit of her sensory environment as experienced through our evolution. That means we have to change our NICUs. We have to open them for the parents. We have to create privacy and intimacy. We have to provide comfortable kangaroo chairs for all of our parents as often as we can do. Let me switch over to transport solutions. One baby, one bed philosophy means you have to transport in your daily routine a baby very often. It starts right after birth, transportation from delivery room to the NICU. We have often tra to transport babies inside the NICU and also not very rare from NICU to the operating theater. And it is very helpful to use for such transport solutions a giraffe omnibed and a shuttle system. It will minimize the risk of, of hypothermia and infections. It will reduce stress for the infant. I mentioned earlier the term controlled handling. And it will also reduce the stress for us as caregivers. We observe reduced workload, time saving up to 25% and in fact it improves safety. And you can see here a short video from the University of Mannheim. Uh, this is a high level prenatal center and they are specialized on the treatment of diaphragmatic hernias and severe respiratory distress syndromes. And they are also fully equipped with omnibeds and you can see here how it works. Transportation of the care station to the DR, preparation for preterm or term delivery resuscitation transition of the baby 
and then dock it on the shuttle and move with one bed up to the neonatal intensive care unit where there's no need to change the baby that will reduce the stress for the child and that will has also some safety benefits to use such kind of transport systems. Temperature, humidity and hygiene is the next topic. The EFCNI just reminds us that until now, four of ten babies worldwide are getting cold stress and they arrive at the NICU under hypothermic conditions. And you may know that uh, everyone Degrees, decrease of uh, every degree of one grad Celsius in a neonatal temperature will result in a 28% increase of mortality and an 11% increase of sepsis. So we have to establish a protective microenvironment and maintain normal thermia. It will Beside mortality and sepsis reduction, preserve valuable energy for the baby, and that means promoting growth. So, in my unit, skin temperature is always server controlled. You can use the one or two point measurement. The skin probe should be attached on the abdomen or flank. We should avoid temperature fluctuations with open portholes. And keep in mind what I mentioned earlier, the disadvantage of enclosed incubator. Limited access by the parents is a consequence. We provide unrestricted skin-to-skin -skin care. The GF Omnibed temperature is several controlled and this helps us to provide thermostability even for very, very tiny infants. So there are no age or weight restrictions regarding to skin to skin contact in our unit. And what I recommend you is to establish humidity guidelines in the unit to improve skin maturation and reduce nosocomial infections. That means, in the end, faster weaning to the crib. Maintaining fluid and heat balance is uh, of vital importance to the newborn infant. At birth, the infant is exposed, exposed to a cold and dry environment. And preterm neonates, in particular, are when at risk of dehydration and also of hypothermia. These conditions may have serious consequences and significantly influence mortality and morbidity. A tiny, immature preterm infant has a high rate of water and heat loss, mainly as a consequence of their immature skin. And the care environment for sure influences the magnitude of water and heat exchange and needs to be individually tailored on the basis of the infant's clinical status. We adapted that from uh, our humidity settings from the guys from Sweden, from uh, uh, Dr. Agren and his colleagues. And you can see here what we are doing for a couple of years very successful. In preterms below 27 weeks, we start with a humidity of 85% in the closed giraffe omnibed for the first week of life. And then we switch right in the seven days after, uh, right in the second week after seven days and reduce the humidity down to 50%. And that allows you to open uh, the incubator for a medium time for procedures or also for parental interactions. From day week three, we open uh, the care station for longer times. At daytimes, we close it for the night to protect the baby from light as well as from noise. And uh, there's a 
longer time frame for parental interaction possible. You see here that for infants above 27 weeks, we start with a humidity of 70% and uh, reduce it also in the second week down to 50%. Let me give you some short messages about uh, hygiene recommendations from a user perspective. We are now using Omnibets for, uh, let's say, 15 years or something like that. What I like really much is that there is a simple and comprehensive cleaning protocol. There are two weeks cleaning cycles, which is saving time and costs as well. We have less condensation through the double wall and uh, the airflow curtain. I don't see any hypothermic problems even in three or 400 gram babies if you are careful enough and know what to do. What I really like is the rare touch philosophy. There is a hands-free alarm and the one touch food opening for the incubator and the canopy. This helps to limit cross contaminations and reduce nosocomial infections. The built-in x-ray support and the rotating mattress are very helpful, not only for the mother, as you can see here, direct eye-to-eye -eye contact between the baby and its mother, also for uh, performing x-rays and other procedures. And the last but not least, the humidification system. There is a bactericidal humidifier with 100 degrees Celsius, which is eliminating bacteria. The water tank is outside the patient compartment without any additional pipes. So there, is a, there are less chances for contamination and less chances for nosocomial infections. Let me, at the end of this webinar, uh, give you a short look into the future. Um, maybe you know the publication from Partridge and colleagues from Philadelphia five years ago. They mentioned that extreme prematurity is the leading cause of neonatal mortality and morbidity due a combination of organ immaturity and iatrogenic injury. And they are working on a so-called artificial womb. You see that here. They try to put very tiny lamps, immature lamps, in uh, some kind of plastic bags. Uh, the fluid and let them grow into that uh, setting for a couple of weeks until they are stable enough to be uh, to get out of that plastic bags. And there is also a lot of research going on to artificial worms. Um, you see that here. Uh, there's a multi-million grant brings artificial worms one step closer. Um, some researchers work also on wearable artificial worms. Uh, you might say it is a nightmare or is it a dream? I let that to you. But the uh, Technical University in Eindhoven in the Netherlands is uh, developing uh, artificial worms maybe in the future. They will uh, give us better chances to treat preterm infants than uh, compared to the nowadays used incubators. I will be on the end of this webinar and uh, I thank you all for listening. Let me give you a short last message. We don't always get to choose what or when, but we almost always choose how we do it. Thank you for listening and I'm may open for some short questions. Thank you very much.